Welcome to the Henry Street Church of Christ Wednesday night Bible class. It's with great enthusiasm that we welcome you to this word of God here tonight. And as always, we appreciate your presence and ask you to invite others out to learn more of God's word as we continue to tread our way through the gospel according to John. Uh, we're getting pretty close to uh, wrapping up the book of Gospel of John, so thank you for coming all this journey all the way through the many verses and chapters of this great work of the Bible. But always remember that we meet here same time, same place every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central Time here on Facebook Live. But also we invite you to come on out and worship with us in person. If you find yourself uh, in the Northeast Alabama area, or just make a trip to come on out and see us, we encourage you to come by and worship with us at 309 Henry Street in the city of Gadsden, Alabama. 35901 is our zip code. And you can find us at www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com. So I thank you for joining us here tonight. I see my good friend and fellow preacher, Gene Craven. Welcome. See our sister in Christ, Benita Thomas, here uh, checking in and of course, that others are going to check in as we go forward as well. Uh, but as we do this here, just want to, again, bring your attention uh, to the fact that we do have a YouTube site here. I don't have my graphics in front of me like I typically do, but you can go to www.youtube.com and search for my name, Anthony O. Norwood of the Henry Street Church of Christ, and you will see that our channel pops up, you know, make sure you see my picture there to get to the right one. And we post videos daily there uh, for your edification. In other words, to build you up, make you strong in Christ for your encouragement, uh, for you to share as well. So when you get to our YouTube site, I ask you and I humbly ask of you, I should say is a better way of saying it, to uh, like, uh, like, share and subscribe to our channels. In doing so, when you share the videos, you are being an ally to the word of God and is spread it to the four winds of the earth, as the Bible would say, as we got to get more and more urgent and more and more uh, pressing as far as getting the gospel out to a dying world. So you can help do that from an electronic standpoint, but you know, nothing beats, obviously, one-on-one uh, -on -one studies with people, bring them to worship, all that. Don't forget to do that, too, because the word is powerful. And when it falls on a good and, and, and fertile ground, I should say, it will take bloom. In other words, they will come forward, give their confession, and be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. So tonight, again, we are going to be in the book, the Gospel of John, part number 66. And we're going to be talking about a statement made by Jesus. They have believed that thou didst send me. Okay. So obviously we're going to be in John chapter number 17, which I call the unity prayer, the unity prayer of Jesus Christ. And actually my graphics did work this time. That's a, just a visual of our YouTube channel. So again, go ahead and patronize it. You just go to uh, youtube.com, type my name, Anthony L. Norwood. And again, you will see the uh, last uh, five videos posted. And again, we do have those broken down into... Uh, categories called playlist on YouTube. Uh, you can get our Gospel of John as we actually post our video of this uh, session within 24 hours, but also uh, you will benefit from the One Minute Inspirations, which is our daily inspirational, uh, daily devotional. And when you subscribe to the channel, you certainly will get notifications of when we post our videos. So again, this is a daily ministry uh, for a daily work of God. And so, again, we, we thank you all for uh, joining us again as well. Can't see everybody's names here, but I do see Sister Pass, Sandra Pass, my wife, Allison, as well. Uh, so we'll go on and we'll get started with the work of all, or word of Almighty God. Let me say it that way. Let's go back to John chapter 17, first five verses first. And I'm going to be reading from the King James Version of the Bible. And, of course, we know the proper way to study the Bible is to... Uh, read the entire thought of God. So that's why we're going to read all five verses. And then, then we'll go back and look at individual verses or a verse or two together and then bring out the meaning. That way we don't divorce uh, the verse from the actual passage of scripture it belongs to so that we interpret it correctly. All right. So John chapter 17, verse one to verse number five reads as follows. 
These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee, as thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. All right, let's go ahead and let's start breaking each of the verses down. In other words, looking at them in detail. Uh, going back to verse number one, it says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. Okay. So as mentioned, Jesus is pictured here. The Bible paints this picture to show us that he was praying intimately. That is, he was praying one-on-one -on -one with the Father God. And this is in the context of him knowing that the crucifixion was in his near future. So the crucifixion was looming near. So now he's speaking to the Father. And that's what we always need to do, is that when we see something coming, Hey, why don't we just pray about it, pray about it then and there and pour out our hearts so that we're able to get through it. OK, so as you can see, and I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit. Jesus prayed before the event and when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed during the event. So in other words, you never can get too much prayer. You never can get too much conversation with God. You can never overseek what you need to get through what you're going through especially when something that is gloomy is coming uh, for you. And so this is exactly what's happening with Jesus right now. He's basically telling God some of his final wishes uh, that he wants uh, done. And he's requesting for his apostles and, of course, us later on in Bible history. But let's go back again to uh, John chapter 17, verse number one, as I got off a little bit tangent there. Again, it says, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. So again, this is Jesus praying intimately with the Father God. In other words, one-on-one -on -one in the shadow of the crucifixion to come. Now, despite this fact, he also prayed that the Father would glorify him. Anybody want to venture a guess at what glorifying means? What, what is he really talking about when he's saying glorify? Well, when you look at the word glorify, glorify means to exalt, to make something look spectacular, to make it look out of the ordinary. So this means that Jesus was saying to show the world his divine nature through the resurrection from the dead. As you know, you continue to read John chapter number 17, you'll see that Jesus is talking about rising from the dead. OK, and we'll come over those. Go over that is. Uh, a little bit later in this lesson here today of the good Lord sees fit. So that's the glory he's talking about, the glory of rising from the dead. So Jesus also rises from the dead, glorifies the father as all powerful as well, because it would be the father that was raising him from the dead. So it shows that God is all powerful, that he can raise even the, de uh, the, 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 the dead as well through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So when you see Jesus rises from the dead. It's a double glory. What I mean by that is showing the Father as supreme and all-powerful. And it's also showing Jesus Christ as the Son and also powerful. Okay? All right. So we'll continue on uh, with the lesson as well. All right. So in this glorification of Jesus that he's asking for, his resurrection would serve as proof that the Father is God and Jesus is the Son. Okay? Okay. That was the main proof that God the Father was sending. Obviously, you know, Jesus did other things like uh, preach a word directly from the Father. Um, he was able to do miracles. But the grand finale, that which was to certainly prove that he's the son of God, would be the resurrection from the dead. This is the event that highlights Jesus as the glorified one. The one that rose from the dead, the one that really was the son of God as proven by the resurrection from the dead. OK, so again, this was foretold in God's word that the son of God would rise from the dead hundreds of years before the crucifixion actually 
happen. When you look at Psalm 16, verse 8, verse 11, which we have studied extensively in the past, so I'll just leave it as a reference point for you. We won't go through it exactly, you know, uh, on this day is what I'm trying to say. But we know that the Son of God, that's a messianic prophecy we call that in, in Psalm 16, verse 8 to verse number 11, was foretold to rise from the dead. Any good Jewish scholar of that time would have known that this was a messianic prophecy. In other words, one of the ways to identify the Son of God when he came to the earth, which Jesus did hundreds of years after Psalm 16, verse 8 to verse number 11. So in other words, there should never have been any degree of disbelief in him being the son of God, because he would certainly rise from the dead later on in Bible history. OK. All right. Let's go on to verse number two. And this is Jesus again, uh, still uh, praying unto his father and our father, the father God. He said, as thou has given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou has given him. All right, let's continue looking at this scripture. Now, during his prayer, talking about the prayer of Jesus, the Lord further reveals he has authority over all mankind. That's what all flesh is. And has been given the ability to grant eternal life to all of his followers. Also notice that those who are Christians are given to the Lord by the Father. As such, Christians belong to both Jesus Christ and God the Father at the same time. So this is why we can call ourselves the children of God. We belong to the same family as Jesus Christ, as the scriptures teach. Jesus is the only begotten son, John 3, verse number 16. In other words, the one that came directly from God. And we are the adopted children of God. That's why Jesus has a preeminence. He is the leader. He is the firstborn. He is the one given authority. That is why he is king. He is head of God's family here on the earth called the church. Okay. God, the father gave him that authority over all of us. These are the things that Jesus just said. Remember what he said in verse two, as thou has given him power over all flesh. So who are the two people speaking in this, or I should say highlighted in his verse, God, the father, and the Son, Jesus Christ. And the Son, Jesus said that God gave him power over all flesh. So that means that our current president, Joe Biden, has to answer to Jesus. That means even uh, with the aggressions that are being made right now by Russia on the borders of Ukraine with the imminent invasion coming, as all the news stations are reporting here today, even Black, uh, Vladimir Putin of Russia is under the control of Jesus and Jesus has power over him, okay? And that you can put anybody else in that uh, framework that I just said. Any prime minister, any president, any dictator, any king, any senator, any congressman, any member of parliament in other countries that use that instead of Congress like we do. Uh, they're all under the authority of Jesus, including myself, including you. And that's why all of us have to answer to him on the judgment day to answer for the deeds that we have done in our body. Matthew 25, 31 to 46 talks about separating the sheep from the goats. You definitely want to be a sheep on the right hand of God. The, the believing and obedient ones of Christ are the only ones that are going to make it unto heaven. Because again, what does the Bible say? God the Father gave him power over all flesh, but also that he should give eternal life to as many as thou has given him. So those that are God's children are Jesus' also uh, uh, servants. And these people have eternal life to say it a different way. So we are certainly children of God thanks to Jesus. Without him, we would have no opportunity for salvation, no relationship with God the Father, no ability to go to heaven, etc. We would be men and women most miserable and doomed if Christ had not died for every last one of us out of love for us. Remember, we serve the very one that said, greater love have no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus will do later on in Bible history. All right, let's continue on to verse number three. The Bible says this again, this is Jesus still speaking. Remember, he's speaking in his prayer unto the father. OK, all right. So let's deal with that here today. Deal with the father's. Uh, information. And he says, and this is life eternal, 
that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. All right. Now, in order to receive eternal life, Jesus further, further tells us that we must know God the Father and him in order to obtain this prize. See, look what it says. That thou might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ. That's one reason why Islam fails very quickly. Because they don't acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God. They don't acknowledge him as the way to heaven. The way to the Father. But the Bible uses and there. That and makes a difference. Meaning you have to have both in order to receive the prize that is given. And that prize is life eternal. So you cannot obey. You cannot have God without the Son. You cannot have the Son without God. Okay? So people must realize you cannot make up religions. You cannot make way up ways to heaven. There's only one way to it, which is Christ Jesus. All right. So ands make a difference. OK, now this means we must have a relationship with both God, the father and his son to be saved. Again, we cannot have a late. We cannot, that is, have a relationship with God, the father without a relationship with Jesus. Jesus is the only means to having a relationship with God the Father and the eternal life that comes with this relationship. You're very familiar with John 14, verse 6 and Acts 4, verse 12, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Acts 4, verse number 12, as I paraphrase, there's no, no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And we know that Romans 5, 9, and verse number 10 tells us that we have justification that is, we're made righteous by the death of Christ, but we'll be saved by his life. In other words, since Jesus rose from the dead, he is powerful and powerful enough to come back and save us too. OK, we don't serve a dead savior. OK, we serve a living savior that not only was crucified, but rose again on the third day, spent 40 days on earth, Acts chapter number one, and then ascended back into heaven. Acts chapter number two, where he's seated at the right hand of God, the father, this very moment. Crown King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, you may not be as familiar with John. I mean, excuse me, Romans chapter five, verse one. But I want to present that unto you as well. And here's what uh, is very important to us. Foundation of Christianity. Uh, Romans chapter five, verse one says, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So our faith, that is. Uh, we put our trust in Christ Jesus, and that brings about peace with God the Father, and only through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That means, folks, when you don't have a relationship with Christ, you don't have peace with God. And that's why the Bible uses the wrath of God to describe the judgment day for those that are not Christians or those that live in hypocrisy uh, on the judgment day. We are blessed to avoid the wrath of God because... We are obedient servants of Jesus Christ. That's the only way that we have peace with God on earth and peace with God forevermore on the judgment day. Let's continue on and let's continue with verse number four. Now, again, we're in John chapter number 17. Uh, John chapter 17, verse number four, just to remind you, and we'll uh, look at it in detail, says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me. To do So again, Jesus is still speaking to the Father um, in his one-on-one -on -one prayer with the Lord uh, as well. Now, how was this done? Well, Jesus certainly glorified the Father during his ministry on earth by a few things he did. And this probably is not an all-inclusive list, but at least gives us some ways of understanding how Jesus personally glorified the Father God. Well, he did this by what he preached. Remember Hebrews 1, verse 1 and verse number 3, that um, God speaks to us through his son, Jesus Christ. So he was obedient in giving us every word from God the Father. He was a vessel of the word of God from the Father, flowing through him, the Son, uh, and reaching us as mankind. So he glorified the Father because he was completely obedient in his preaching ministry of delivering the word of God without addition and of subtraction, right? And that was in, in order for us to be reconciled with the Father, as the Father God uh, told him to do. Remember, the word reconciled means so that we can be at peace with the Father God. Jesus also 
glorify the Father God by obeying the Father in all things. Remember, there was nothing that Jesus ever did wrong. Jesus was the only human being that ever lived, including you and I, that lived in perfection. Uh, Hebrews 4, 14 to 16 shows us that he was tempted in all points like we are, yet without sin. Even if you take the greatest, uh, you know, what I mean by that, the most well-known figures in the Bible, you'll understand that even they sinned. They had issues unlike Jesus Christ. You know, remember Abraham lied about, you know, his wife uh, being his sister only and not his wife. Okay. He did that to reserve himself. That was one of the flaws of Abraham, even though Abraham is considered the father of faith by God the Father. We know that David was considered a man after God's own heart, despite the fact that David had set up a man for his own, you know, to be murdered in um, Bathsheba's husband and tried to cover that up through lies. OK, but at the end of the day, obviously, God would have forgiven him. He received grace and mercy as well. And that's why God was able to call him a man after God's own heart. Even Job, the great hero of uh, not cursing God and staying constant with God, he, when you look at the closing verse uh, chapters of the Bible, he sinned too. And not that he had cursed God, but he sinned in questioning God. That was his problem. And, you know, at the end of that, when you look at chapters 40 and 41 of the book of Job, there had to be an offering that was made for Job and his friends because they had sinned. Okay? Uh, Job's friends sinned by not telling the truth. Uh, you know, accusing Job of certain things that Job wasn't doing. And then Job had to repent of questioning God, okay, that God comfort, confronted him about. So we won't keep going into that, but that's three good examples. of three of the most famous and those considered to be righteous men of the Bible that were flawed. Uh, but at the same time, you'll see that Jesus is the only one considered not flawed at all. Remember Hebrews 4, 14 and 16 was tempted in all points like we are yet without sin. So his obedience glorified the father. It showed that the father was supreme in his heart and he reduced himself to the servitude of a man made flesh and live manhood, human beinghood, if you will. I know it's not a word, in perfection, showing us how to do it. Uh, Jesus also glorified the father by working miracles the father empowered him to do. So those are at least uh, three different ways of uh, uh, Jesus uh, being there to uh, glorify the Father. Okay. All right. Welcome all those that just come. I've, I've seen uh, Sister Heath, Sister Carlisle. I've seen uh, my mom and, and, and uh, Brother Johnson, uh, Brother Nico. Uh, thanks for coming. And Brother Chidi all the way from Nigeria. Thank you for uh, coming as well. Uh, but getting back to our lesson now. Remember, to show that God the Father is sovereign and that we truly love him, we must also follow in Jesus' footsteps and do the same things, okay? In other words, what I mean by that is that we must also obey the Father. That's how we glorify uh, the Father. That's how we show that he is supreme in our lives, that, you know, in lack of a better way of saying it, he occupies a special position in our lives. And remember, these are some of the most uh, rock solid verses. These are foundational verses of the Christian faith that I have on your screen now. Matthew chapter 22, verse number 37 out of the King James Version. Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Remember when Jesus gives that commandment and he used the word love, he always uses the word agape. Remember, you're very familiar with the Greek word agape from which the English word love is translated, meaning what? Self-sacrificial and unconditional love toward the Father from us. So remember, to in order to love God the Father unconditionally, you love him in the good times and the bad times. You know, whether you're going through uh, prosperous times or you're doing so, you know, or you're going through some things that are challenging in your life, you still love God and you do that by obeying him. Right. So you do that unconditionally. OK, you don't love God just because he's blessing you. You love God because of who he is. He is your father um, and you have a relationship with him. You love him because of the relationship and who he is. OK, because you think about it now, if you don't get everything you want from him, you'll start acting like a spoiled brat. You know, you'll, de you'll defy God because you're using God instead of 
having a relationship with him. And that's one reason why people aren't consistent in the church, because they're using God instead of trying to be close to God in a true relationship of father and child. OK, which is, again, demonstrated by obedience unto God. OK, and remember, it's self-sacrificial. We have to give up some things in order to please God. We have to give up sin. We have to give up rebellion. Uh, sometimes we have to put our wishes uh, behind what God wants from us. And that's how you truly obey God. That's how you glorify him like Jesus is glorifying him, right? Jesus obeyed even to the point of nails in his hands and his feet, the beatings he took, being spit upon, all those things he knew was coming. He knew was the plan of God for his life. And he still went through with them. OK, so again, what was he? Unconditional and self-sacrificial. You don't see Jesus when he was getting whipped by Pilate's men cursing God. No, he never did that. Right. Because he still loved God. He loved God unconditionally, even though he was his back was getting getting ripped apart, if you will, by a whip. He still never turned on the father. He still loved the father unconditionally. Right. Um, and he did it obviously self-sacrificially because he was executing the plan of God all the way through the crucifixion and taking his very last breath in obedience to the word of almighty God. So again, God wants us to obey. That's how we express our love uh, to him. That's why you have first John five verse three out there to keep us thinking properly where the Bible says, for this is the love of God. That's that agape word. Uh, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. In other words, his commandments are not a burden to us. We should not get upset because God tells us uh, to stop doing something. We should not get upset because God wants us to sacrifice some things. We should not get upset uh, by the fact that we should keep God uh, uh, at the forefront of our minds and before our lives. OK, uh, that means his commandments are not grievous. They, does not, they don't bring any sadness or anger or any anguish uh, to us. But we're glad to serve God because of our relationship uh, with him. All right, let's continue on here. Hope everybody's still with me here. Won't be, be long tonight. But these are some heavy and deep things that we must consider. We can't avoid these things. So going back to John chapter number 17. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. So obviously then Jesus humbled himself and obeyed the Father to the fullest. For an example for us to imitate, as we just talked about in Hebrews 4, 14 to 16, and also you can read the same type of thing, same thoughts in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and verse number 2. So again, this is how we glorify God as well through obedience. All right, let's go on to verse number 5 that says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before... The world was. So Jesus is really starting to get into the divinity side of things. He was saying that uh, he had the glory uh, before the world was along with the father. So before the creation of man, before there was Adam and Eve, before there was an earth, before there was water, before there was land, before there were uh, fowl, meaning birds, before there were animals, before there were insects. Before there was an earth, before there was the sun, before there was the moon, before there was anything, God and the uh, and Jesus Christ were glorified, which means they were above all these things and they existed before all of these things. Oh, that's some powerful things. If you say we could just have a lesson on that tonight, if we really wanted to, about the divinity of Christ. So this is a divinity statement of Christ in regards to himself. So Jesus was more than just a man. Remember the Bible says in John 1 verse 7 to 14 that he became flesh. So that means Jesus was something before he became human. Okay. So again, this is talking about the divinity of Christ that many people reject. And they reject it to the uh, having argumentation against the word of God itself. But I don't know about you, but I am going to take the word of God over any argument man makes. The Muslims make huge arguments against the divinity of Christ. But the Bible talks about it. So I'm going to believe the Bible and not the prophet Muhammad. Right. Or what they call the prophet Muhammad. Uh, I don't acknowledge that as him as a prophet. But anyway. 
Um, I take that over what the Jehovah Witnesses uh, talk about. You know, they want to call him Michael, the archangel. Jesus and Michael are not the same people, not the same person, right? Uh, Michael is a created being. Angels are created just like men. Jesus was not created. Jesus existed before the world was created. Okay. All right. So uh, I want you to see the divinity statement that's being made here. Jesus is even acknowledging his own divinity in this statement in verse number five. Because remember, the uh, God, the Godhead, I should say, using the biblical term, is what? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't have time to prove that tonight because we talked about that extensively. But this is another statement in which Jesus is identifying his divine status, meaning more than a man. You know, the other part that was really, um, really profound that we studied back uh, in the book of John here. Can't remember the exact chapter, but remember when the Jews wanted to stone him, they stoned him because he said before Abraham was, I am. That also is a divinity statement because Abraham lived hundreds of years before Christ. So how could he exist before Abraham? It's because he was divine before he became a man. OK, very, very simple explanation. All right. So let's go back here. And I've, I've gone off into a tangent, but let's go into back into John chapter 17, verse one and verse five. Let me read verse five one more time just to get us back on track. He says, and this is Jesus in his prayer. He says, and now, O father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. So Jesus also asked for the glory he had before the world was created. What Jesus is saying at this point is that he wanted to return to his heavenly status of divinity seated at the right hand of God, the father. OK, and that certainly happened after the death, the burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus later in Bible history. Remember, John, in chapter 17, the whole book of John was is before the book of Acts. The book of Acts really documents the time of Jesus ascending to heaven and sitting down on his own throne next to God, the father. John chapter number 17 is before Acts and it talks more about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. The ascension came in the next book, which is in Acts chapter 1 and chapter number 2. Okay, so hopefully you understand that. So keep them in chronological order. John, the, uh, well, keep them all in, in chronological order. And they're, they're written in the Bible for that reason. The books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are highlighting the sonship of Jesus and they're demonstrating from a historical standpoint the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. The book of Acts is really speaking more on the lines of the ascended Jesus, okay? Not the suffering Savior. The suffering Savior is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the book of Acts is talking about the resurrected and ascended Savior, okay? The King, okay? And the book of Revelation is talking about the triumph of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and the Judgment Day. OK, just give you some some of the breakdown of the Bible. It's a very, very rough outline of it. But, you know, you got to understand where you're at in the Bible in order to understand individual verses and chapters of the book verse, uh, and chapters of each of the uh, books there. So you don't get lost in the study. Remember, you got to always remember the big picture when you're studying the small verses in each of uh, the chapters of the Bible. All right, let's go back on and continue here. All right, let's go back to John chapter number 17. Again, I call this the unity prayer of Jesus Christ, okay? Now go to John chapter 17, verse six to verse number eight. Let's read that out of the King James Version. Here's what Jesus is saying. Again, he's praying to the Father God. He says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given them unto the words. Let me go back and read that right here. Verse 8 says, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I, had, that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. That's our title here. They have believed that thou didst send me. That's John chapter 17, verses 6 to verse number 8. Now, let's look at these in an individual way, in more detail. Verse 6 says, I have revealed you 
I have revealed you to those whom you, you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Now, the NIV, New International Version, does an excellent job of translating John chapter 17, verse number 6, which we just read. Okay. Now, Jesus' ministry revealed the Father to the world. How is this done? Remember, the Bible says he is the exact image of God the Father. In Hebrews 1, verse 1 to verse number 3, that's a, 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 a King James Version of saying that God, uh, Jesus is the exact copy, the exact duplication of God the Father. You'll see exactly what that means in a minute. So this means that Jesus is exactly like God the Father. That's why he was telling his apostles, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. In other words, there's going to be no difference between the two of them, though they're two separate people. Yes, they are. Their ways are exactly alike. Okay? That's how Jesus can be the exact image. Uh, the, as Like I said, the King James Version uses the words express image of God the Father. Okay? All right. Thus to know Jesus is to know God the Father. Okay? So let's give some examples of this. What makes Jesus happy makes the Father happy. Because remember, they're exact duplications of each other, in lack of a better way of explaining it to us as human beings. What pleases Jesus pleases the Father. What angers Jesus angers the Father. What disappoints Jesus disappoints the Father. Likewise, because why? They're part of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as the word of God just said, he's the express image of the Father God. Okay, that's why I say their ways are exactly alike, an exact duplication. So whatever Jesus would do, God the Father would do also. Okay, so think about it that way. Okay, and whatever it takes to please the Father pleases Jesus and vice versa. Okay, all right. So again, this is why we trust Jesus with spiritual leadership for our lives and the salvation of our souls. In doing so, we are automatically pleasing to the Father God. Remember, as Jesus points out in this verse, those who are Jesus' followers are also followers of the Father. Okay? Think about what Jesus just said. Let's go back in verse 6. He said, I have revealed to you, the, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. See, no, look, look at what happens. Whoever uh, is uh, a Christian has been given to Christ by the Father God. In other words, we belong to both of them at the same time. Okay. All right. So let's continue on. And again, he says, and they have obeyed your words. So those that have obeyed are the children of God. Okay. We belong to the Father and Christ when we obey the word of God. All right. Verse number seven and verse number eight. As we complete this round of scriptures from John 17, verse 6 to verse number 8. So verse 7 and verse number 8, again, for a refresher of our memory, says, Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Again, our title for our lesson tonight. Now, the apostles and all Christians know for sure that the words Jesus was given to preach to mankind came from the Father God as well, which we studied already. Thus, whatever Jesus says must be obeyed. There's not an option to it because his words are the words of God, the Father. He was a messenger for the Father. So denying or disobeying Jesus' words is literally an offense against the word of God. OK, because remember, what did we say? In the scriptures, Colossians 2, verse 14, Hebrews 12, 24, that Jesus is the giver of the new covenant. The new covenant, meaning the New Testament, came from God the Father first, passed on to Jesus, passed on to the apostles, and given to us. Okay? So Jesus is the mediator of the New Testament. In other words, he delivered literally the word of God that we must believe and obey in order to be saved. All right, let's go on to the next grouping of verses here. Time is trying to get by us here. May not finish everything I have on the plate for us tonight, but that's okay, because I believe that this lesson is still rich in knowledge for us. All right, let's read verses 9 to verse number 12, and this is out of the King James Version. And John chapter 17, verse 9 to verse number 12 says, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. 
And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep thou thine own name. Oh, keep through, excuse me. Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. That's why I call this unity prayer. Verse 12 says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. All right, let's move on. Verse number nine, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. All right. Now, here you see Jesus' big heart of compassion is always extended to the apostles and all Christians. He wants to he wants to make sure all of us are kept in the right spiritual condition so eternal life and heaven will be our home. He does not want to lose any of us to eternal punishment. He and the Father both care about our eternity. Because remember, this was a master plan from God the Father and Jesus to save mankind. And think about this. Remember, God is not a vindictive or evil type of person. He literally does not want anybody to go to eternal punishment. That's why 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 9 reveals this to us. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning this promise. Now, he's talking about the second coming of Christ. God is not delayed, is a way of saying that. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, to us. In other words, uh, Christ has not been sent back. Uh, for the second coming, because that would usher in a judgment. And with that being said, there would be a lot more people lost who have never um, uh, obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what God is doing, he's tolerating man. OK, he's having patience with mankind across the globe um, so that none of us perish if that's possible. That's why he's saying not willing that any should perish. That means to go on to eternal punishment, but that all should come to repentance. So the more time we have on earth. The more God gives mankind to repent, that is to turn to Christ, to turn away from their evil lies so that they can be saved. Because uh, God could have sent Jesus back a long time ago to end all this. But he did not do so out of compassion for mankind because he's doing the most to maximize the word of God going out into the earth for people to believe and obey it so they can be saved. So remember, think about it this way. Each day that the world still stands, each day that there's not a second coming of Christ is God's mercy on mankind to give us more and more opportunities to be saved, okay? For those that don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, that those have not made him their Lord and their Savior, okay? All right, so let's move on to uh, the next verse, verse 10. Again, it's Jesus still praying to the Father. He says, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. So Jesus again reveals to us that those who are disciples of Jesus are also the Father's followers. We've, we've covered, that, covered that extensively so far. As taught earlier, we cannot belong to God without belonging to Jesus first. We glorify Jesus by accepting him as the Son of God and doing all that he says for us to do. All right, verse number 11. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. So we're really getting heavy into the unity part of the church that Jesus wants then and now and until he comes back. So here in this verse, too, don't, we don't want to skip over some things, but Jesus foretells his death, his resurrection and ascension into heaven during his prayer to God the Father before it happened. Okay. He prays that the apostles would be kept from spiritually falling away from salvation. Okay. And he, he also prays that the father would keep the apostles in perfect unity while he resides in heaven. Of course, this desire of Jesus is also extended to the entire Christian community. Okay. So we as Christians must put in the effort to make sure we, we remain peaceful with each other in order to maintain this unity. And Ephesians 4 verse 1 to verse number 3 uh, teaches us this. You're no stranger to this, uh, Henry Street, uh, because we stress it a lot. And that's to make sure that devil, the devil can't infiltrate our, 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 our congregation and cause havoc in it. You know, because we don't want to be the weak link that lets them in and destroys the unity. Uh, Ephesians 4, verse 1 and verse 3 says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. In other words, live the Christian life in obedience. 
with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. This is talking about how the church is to relate to each other. We're not to be arrogant with each other. We're supposed to be gentle with each other. We're supposed to be patient with each other and forbearing with each other, which means we tolerate each other. Okay. And in doing so, we have to endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. In other words, we have to make it our goal and we must put in the effort to keep the unity of the spirit. In other words, the unity that the Holy Spirit calls for us to have. How do you do it? God says it what? In the bond of peace. That which brings us together is us all being peacemakers, one with another, actively trying to make peace with each other uh, at all times, right? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called what, church? The children of God, according to Matthew chapter number five. All right, let's continue on. Verse 12 says, this is Jesus still talking to the Father in prayer. He says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. But the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Prior to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the Lord was the apostle's spiritual protector on earth. He kept them from falling away from salvation during his earthly ministry. Now, when he returns to heaven, which happened after the ascension later in Bible history, he requests the Father to continue his work of keeping the apostles saved. He stated that only one of the apostles had fallen from grace, which we know was Judas Iscariot. Now, Judas was called the son of perdition, which means the one that belongs to perdition. Perdition is another word for destruction. That's talking about eternal punishment. So when God uses the word son of perdition, that means he looks at, at Judas as one that belongs to the family of those that are being destroyed. OK, because sometimes God what does what we call personification. He'll take a concept and act as if it was a person. So perdition, meaning destruction, he's looking at it like as a person, as if he gave birth to Judas. OK, but nonetheless, to keep it real simple, it just means that one that belongs to destruction. OK. Now, remember this, and we talked about it extensively, too, in the past. I won't go over it very long, but I want you to keep this in mind because you'll run into this like I did in a barber shop years ago. When I had, and, and, you know, my barber was teaching some, some, some nonsense um, that wasn't in the Bible, that Judas was saved. There's no way that Judas could be saved. He was called the son of perdition. That means the son of destruction. He's the one in the Bible that we know for sure is going to eternal punishment. That's the one that God judged. Before even the judgment day came. Okay. So again, the scriptures did not destine Judas uh, Iscariot to eternal punishment as if he did not have any choice in the matter. Instead, the Old Testament foretold of the choice Judas would make, causing him to inherit eternal punishment. According to Psalm chapter 41, verse 9, which was written hundreds of years before Judas was even born. And it told that Judas would betray the Lord. Okay. Basically. And that happened in Acts chapter 1, verse 15 and 26. In other words, Judas had already committed suicide and uh, we are told that he went to his own place. That is, he went to a place different than where the apostles were going, which we know means that he wasn't going to salvation like they were. He didn't have heaven as his home. He was going to his own place. He was going to be the one disciple that would end, excuse me, the one apostle that would end up going to eternal punishment because of the choice he made in order to betray the Lord Jesus Christ. God judged him even before it happened. OK. All right. People often, again, confuse prophecy as something uh, taking away the will of mankind. That's not true. Prophecy in this case is just foretelling what choice someone would make before they made it. Remember, God knows all things. So God can see the, the choice you're going to make. It's a Wednesday now. He knows what you're going to do when, you, uh, when Friday before Friday comes. OK. He knows what you're going to do a year from now. You know, God just knows these things. And God just chose to tell the future about Judas before it even happened. He chose to uh, talk about the choice Judas would make. He didn't make Judas do anything. Judas did all this stuff on his own. So unfortunately, uh, God foretold the betrayal of Judas against the Lord, causing Judas to miss out on heaven. There's no way in the world that Judas was going to heaven because God already told us that he wasn't. Okay. All right. Really quickly here. Let's continue. Well, I think we're going to let it go here tonight because we've got about nine minutes here. We'll pick up um, starting with uh, John chapter 17, verse number 13 on next occasion. Remember your homework. It's always in Acts chapter number 17. Be like the ancient Bereans. 
that studied behind the Apostle Paul to see if the things were so. You never take a man's word when he talks about spiritual things because you're talking about your soul salvation. Okay, one word, uh, one concept, one idea could be wrong and will keep you from seeing heaven if you gullibly follow uh, what people say and don't study for yourself. Remember Matthew 15 verse 14, God says that the blind lead the blind, they all fall in the ditch. You don't want to go uh, somewhere in error because somebody else made an error. You want to study these things for yourself and follow nothing but what the word of God may say. All right. Thank you, uh, Sister Woody, for joining us as well. I'm mentioning names. So I normally don't do that just to show you appreciation, not to call anybody out, but to call you out as a brother, sister in Christ and show my love for all of you. So again, I want to express my love and appreciation for everybody that's come out here tonight. Remember to join us again on Facebook Live every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. I really appreciate, again, um, all that join us. We often have uh, those that join us from India, Pakistan, Nigeria, the Philippines, and other places. And so I know that you are way ahead of us in time. I'm going to pick with my, my good friend here and fellow preacher in Christ and uh, brother Ch uh, Chidi in New Oha, uh, my Igbo brother. That's uh, my tutor in Igbo and also a great uh, gospel preacher in and of itself. He is six hours ahead of us. So I'm thinking, brother Chidi, you might need to be in bed right now. <laughs> you might be a little tired, but no, I'm just joking with you and thanking you for uh, joining us as well. And everybody that's ahead of us, I know India is several hours ahead of us and Pakistan and you guys are making a serious um, sacrifice with being with us here tonight. I thank my dear brother, that uh, Brother Gene out here, great gospel preacher. We worship together at the Northwestern Church of Christ in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I think you're ahead in time with us too. Uh, so thank you for making the sacrifice you have. And all of you again, Henry Street, for coming out to uh, learn another portion of God's word. But remember, be ready to put your cur cur uh, courier shoes on, your post office shoes. I'm talking about for the gospel. Remember the plan of salvation. It starts in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Uh, remember, the second part of the plan of salvation is faith in Jesus as the Son of God, meaning the Lord and Savior, the Christ. Uh, is in John 3, verse number 16, that says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The third part of plan of salvation is our response of behavior change. That's called repentance. That is where we turn from our old ways and turn to the new way of obeying God instead through Christ Jesus. You'll see in Luke 13, verse 3 and verse number 5. The fourth part of the plan of salvation is our verbal response to the word of God. That is, we must make a confession with our mouths that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, which means our Lord in order to be saved. You see that in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and verse number 10, uh, Matthew 10, 32 and 33, and Acts 8, verse 37, just for three passages of scripture that show us that confession is necessary for our salvation. And of course, we must go down in the watery grave of baptism for our salvation. We're probably saying, why, salvation? Why, why water baptism? The Bible talks about it. Acts 22, verse 16 says, that's where God washed away our sins. It's for a good conscience. In other words, that's when God forgives us of our sins. You see that in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 21. Uh, it's for the forgiveness of our sins, also in Acts 2, verse 38. It's also to put us in the body of Christ, which means to make us a Christian child of God, also known as being a member of the church. You see that in Galatians 3, verse 27. And it also changes us from unsaved to saved in our status with God, how God thinks about us. In Mark 16, verse number 16, Jesus said it himself. He said, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And of course, after you become a Christian, uh, that means when you come out of the water grave of baptism, forgiven, you remain saved by continuing to follow Jesus until your death. That's what Jesus calls faithfulness. It means to continue to be a follower. Keep believing and obeying him to the end. And heaven is going to be your home. He says in Revelation 2, verse number 10, be thou faithful unto death and I will give thee a crown of life. That's given uh, as a commandment to the Christian community. He's saying, stay loyal to me and I will reward you with eternal life when all is said and done. This be said in a layman's way here today. Um, but of course, if you're a Christian that's fallen short, don't give up. Don't give in. Don't quit. Because if grace and mercy is still available to you in Acts 8, verse 22 and 1 John 1, 7 and verse number 10, that God says, if you're willing to repent, confess your fault to him and ask him to forgive you, then he will certainly do just that. You'll be back at peace with God once again and on your way to heaven once again. 
So once again, um, we encourage you to come on out and worship with us on Sunday mornings. If you find yourself in the uh, Northeast Alabama area in the United States, come and visit us at 309 Henry Street, the city of Gaston, Alabama, 35901 being our zip code. And of course, uh, you can find us easily at www.henrystreetchurchofchrist.com. Don't forget our YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe to it, like and share the videos to be an ally in spreading the word of God as well. Love you all. Thank you all uh, for being here. And since my dear brother here uh, in Chidi, my tutor, I hope you'll be proud with me because I'm going to greet you uh, goodbye in the Igbo way. I say this to my uh, wife at night uh, as well. I say kachifo to her, which meaning good night. Everybody have a good day and thanks for joining us once again. God bless you. Bye bye.